Good afternoon, everyone. Andy, go sit down. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, we know it's after lunch, but we are here celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Institute for Policy Studies. <laughs> but really, we are celebrating you. Each of you as activists, as scholars, as analysts, as people who are just mad and ready to organize and do something about it. For the last five decades, you have been a part of this movement for change. We thank you for being here this afternoon on a rainy Saturday, um, and we really applaud all that you do. So we are on a very tight schedule, but we're gonna try to do this all well. This session is all about celebrating movements, global civil society, social movements that have been making change happen. And we know historically, that's how change comes. Whether it's the anti-slavery movement where it was people organizing, writing letters, uh, demonstrating, demanding change, those who were enslaved and those who were people of conscience organizing. When it came to Jim Crow legislation, again, it was people saying no. Saying no to oppression, saying no to racism in this country and around the world. We know our colleagues from South Africa know it best, the anti-apartheid struggle. Again, movements for change demanding a better way. The women's rights movement, the environmental justice movement, there have been in our history, and Howard Zinn probably chronicles it best of all, right? These movements that have stood up to demand a better way, to demand justice, to demand rights. This panel is talking about what the New York Times called the other superpower the peace movement, the people's movement, all around the world. We have seen it rise up, not just around ending the Iraq war, and more recently the Syrian war, but around fighting for greater democracy in places like Egypt, in places like Tunisia, people demanding their voice. So we are carving out this panel to talk about it. We have an amazing, amazing array of speakers. You are going to hear from Phyllis Bennis, very much linked to stopping the war with Iraq and now with Syria and, and raising up <coughs> peace movements globally. We are honored to have her at the Institute for Policy Studies. Phyllis Bennett will be one of our first presenters. Uh, <laughs> we have Manuel, Manuel Perez Rocha who comes out of Mexico and will be sharing with us the lessons of the Chiapas movement 20 years, almost 20 years later sharing that experience with us. Uh, we have Alexis Goldstein. Alexis is with the other 98. But before that, she was Occupy Wall Street, right? And before that, she was on Wall Street, working in the financial district. <laughs> so we are honored that she is here to lend her experiences. But you know, we're going to actually kick this off as we've learned from Andy Shalau and others who were saying, put the fun in it. We are gonna yeah, kick this off with a dynamic, dynamic poem from a spoken word artist, Lauren, who is part of the DC Youth Poetry Slam. She's gonna get us in this spirit right. So Lauren, we are so honored that you are here. they've just come back from South Africa. So they're DC Youth Slam, but they're part of a global movement of young poets who are visioning a better world. We're so happy that you are here. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. I miss you so much. I miss your skin and the, may it, the way it matched with earth as if God himself molded you from red clay, your green eyes, a dark forest green, your existence is sun-kissed. And I miss the air we breathe together, because you're beautiful. And every second I'm not with you feels like eternity. I remember the first time we slept together. I didn't sleep. I tossed and I turned. Nightmares woke me up in a cold sweat, but I loved you. And now it's hard to sleep without you. No matter how many pictures we have together, nothing will ever amount to being with you. I miss you. 
I miss listening to music with you. Songs that sounded like a thousand souls rejoicing to the same beat and the way our hearts beat to the same beat and our souls sung the same songs the way your welcomings welcomed me in my own language. See, I never wanted to leave you. I knew nothing more beautiful than the mountains that lined your skyline. I have never seen the earth more clearly. So I felt so at home with you because you taught me to be hungry and that my art won't always be accepted, that I'm special and I have a gift and I should be proud to use it and that my art knows no boundaries and that I can connect with people whom I thought I had nothing in common with. Do you remember the first time I performed for you? Hands shaking, body trembling. It was much more than nerves. I just wanted to make sure you felt me. I gave you everything I could. I bore my soul on that stage for you, ripped my heart right out of my chest for you. I never wanted to impress you. I just wanted you to hear me. I formed a bond with you that I could never break. I just hoped you would never forget me. Do you know how many times I cried for you? Because I had to leave you. And I left you with a piece of myself. Promise me you won't lose it because I will always have a piece of you with me. I found a home in your heart, South Africa. I love you more than I love my own country. See, you made me happy, more happy than I could have ever made myself. I promise I'll never forget you, not your son and the way it kissed my skin, not your food, your streets, your bitter mornings, your songs, your joy, your kumbis, your laughter, your language, and your happiness. I had been looking for the old me, and you helped me find her. I had lost her amongst all things unholy, and you made me feel whole again. I found my smile, my laughter, my thoughts, and my comfort, and I'm not sure how I could find home so many miles away from where I live, but I miss you so much. And I promise I'll never forget anything you taught me, but I miss you so much. out of poetry and activism in DC, taking it across to South Africa and bringing it back home. What we're talking about are social movements, are people's movements, right? They are ignited by poetry, by art, by culture, by music, by food, <laughs> all the joys that bring us all together. And what we're gonna talk about is how they've happened, what have been the challenges, what have been the successes, what needs to happen in the next 50 years for the other superpower to reign supreme? Phyllis, we're gonna kick it off with you. It's a hell of a hard act to follow, you guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Slam Team. <laughs> How many of you were in the streets on February 15th, 2003, protesting the looming war in Iraq? You guys were too young, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, a lot. You know, I think sometimes some of us who lived through that day forget that not everyone did, and not everyone knows the origins of the term the second superpower. It's like, what? What does that mean? I, you know, we remember the Cold War, there were two superpowers, right? The US and the Soviet Union, two superpowers. Bipolar world, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Done. So what happened that day was that people in 850 cities, around the world, somewhere between 12 and 15 million of them, on one day, one singular day, marched around the world with one demand, the same words in a 100 different languages. The world says no to war. Very simple, very simple. And all around the world, people were saying, no, this does not speak for us, not in our name, not in the name of anyone we know, not in the name of the people of Iraq. We do not stand with this war. We do not stand for this war. And we will not let this pass. And it was so big and so unified. And it also brought together, besides those people, governments, mainly for opportunist reasons of their own, a few. And then eventually, because there were so many governments that were refusing the US pressure, resisting the US pressure to endorse the war, that the UN had to do what its charter says it's supposed to always do, but it so rarely does, stand against the scourge of war. That's supposed to be the main thing, right, for the UN? How often do they really do it? The US doesn't let them do it. But that time, they did it. 
They refused to endorse the war, refused to pass a resolution endorsing the war. So it meant the war was going to be illegal because we made it impossible for governments all around the world, from Brazil to South Africa to India to Britain to France, the biggest protests were in the countries whose leaders were supporting the wars. So the biggest protests were in Spain and Britain. It was an extraordinary moment. It failed to prevent that war. It was clear that civil society simply did not matter when there was a unified trajectory of power in Washington that was going to wage a war as the linchpin of a strategy of empire, a strategy of overthrowing governments in the Middle East and remaking them in the interests of the United States. But we didn't fail. That movement was hugely important. At the time, it was important around Iraq simply for ensuring that the war was illegal, et cetera. But way more than that, it set the stage for other victories to come. There's an incredible story. I'll probably tell the story later at the plenary, but just the brief version of it is, I, I didn't know any of this a couple of years ago, but there was a group, there was a pro, one of the protests was in Egypt, in Cairo. But it was very small. It was a couple of hundred people and about 500 police. You know, the <laughs> usual thing in, in protest demonstrations in Cairo. And the people who were organizing it were saying to each other, God, this is so embarrassing. And one of them said, you know, we're watching these white whiskey swilling infidels in their, mil in their millions out in the streets to prevent a war in our part of the world. And what are we doing? Bupkis, you know, <laughs> they didn't say that. They don't speak Yiddish, but you know, you, you, get, you get my point. They, they were sort of embarrassed and they pledged that day that they would do better next time. Well, the next time came around eight years later, 2011, in the Tahrir Square streets that they had had that first embarrassing demonstration, and all of a sudden it was no embarrassment. All of a sudden they were overthrowing a dictator. And, and they talked about how it began with February 15th. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about that. What does that mean? How do we define global movements? You know, there have been periods during the Vietnam War. There were protests all around the world. Everybody in the world was protesting that war. It's not as if nothing global had ever happened. But nothing like this had ever happened. There had never been a global day. There had never been the technology to organize it. It was organized in six weeks, that whole amazing protest. And I got to tell you, after the months it took us to organize this weekend, I'm kind of in awe that we pulled that off in six <laughs> weeks. It was, but you know, we never had the internet. We never had easy long distance phones. We never had Twitter and Facebook and all those things that made the organizing of it so much easier. It's not organizing. Putting something on Facebook, as we know, isn't organizing. But it's a way of sharing information that makes the organizing that does go on person to person, face to face, hand to hand, mouth to mouth, all of that goes on when we can share information more easily. And that's what a global movement really looks like. The other thing that made it a global movement was that people all around the world recognized the potential of a war in Iraq as a global threat. It was the tip of the iceberg. It was the point of the spear. It was whatever analogy you want to use about a really, really bad foreign policy of this country that was going to devastate the rest of the world. And everybody understood that. Everybody understood. People who were working on the environment, people who were working on challenging corporate power, people who were working on women's rights, people who were working on gay and lesbian and transgender rights, everybody understood that the war in Iraq was not something we could accept. So with that rising global threat, there was a global protest. And we've seen it again from 2011 on. We saw it in the Occupy movements here. We saw it with the indignados in Spain. We saw it in Turkey, in Brazil, in, in the continuing uh, uh, crisis of the Arab Spring, a crisis of illegitimacy of power. Because globally now, people understand power as a global problem. So we have to have movements that challenge power globally where the movements themselves are global and they're challenging global power. So what's, the, what's the, the potential for this? Are these movements, the Arab Spring, the Indignados, Occupy, are they actually global movements or are they inspiring global movements? I would say if we're trying to be analytical and really understand these differences, try and learn from them, February 15th was a truly global mobilization, a, a truly global demonstration. The Arab Spring and all that has come from it has been 
I would say, inspired by each other. Media like Al Jazeera, that everybody in the region was watching, inspired people to do the same thing, but the origins were very national. So in Tunisia, the fundamental question was dignity, the dignity of people, of workers, to not be slapped around by the police. In Egypt, it was jobs that motivated the, this extraordinary moment. In Syria, ironically enough, it was climate that was the, the thing that gave rise to it. We need to build on that. The, the work that we did last month in stopping a new war in the Middle East by preventing US military strikes in, in Syria, this is rooted in the work we did for February 15th. It's the same organizations doing the same work <coughs> against a new enemy, a different kind of war. That wasn't ever gonna be a war like we saw in Iraq with the mobilization of 150,000 troops and a decade-long occupation. This is a whole different strategy. This is a strategy of drones and special operations and night raids and things in the shadows. And it's much harder to mobilize against that. But globally, more and more people are starting to understand the drone war as a global threat, the special operations wars as a threat globally to peace and security, yes, but also to the right of self-determination of every country and the human rights of all people. So that, I think, is our challenge. That's what we can learn from the actions that we took on February 15th, and that is how we can apply them in this next period. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Well said. Remembering the power of February 15th and how it has transformed so much since then. Well, we're gonna move to one of those transformational movements. Uh, talking about Occupy and maybe a little bit about the other 98. Uh, Alexis Goldstein, you have the floor. Um, I feel like I should start off by saying I am a pale imitation of the person who should have been on this panel in my place, which is my colleague Samantha Corbin, who works with me at the other 98%, but who I met um, at Occupy Wall Street, and she's a wonderful individual who does most of our um, sort of direct actions and does what we call action coordinating, which is basically when any group wants to have a direct action, you need some help and you need some creative thoughts. Um, she's just a mastermind at it, so just wanted to give a shout out to Sam. Um, so I spent seven years on Wall Street and then quit. Um, I was really miserable. Uh, but I quit in 2010, and then Occupy came around in 2011. So it wasn't like a sort of a cause and effect. Occupy happened, I quit my job. I had already quit my job. But um, I just want to talk about what it did to me and the things that it made me think of. And hopefully that um, will resonate to some extent with all of you and with the theme of the, of the day. Um, and for me, it was a particularly challenging experience because I think a lot of people came to Occupy. Well, before I, I do that, can I just see who in the room went to an Occupy event at some point. Great. So a lot of people came in it having already been involved in activism for a really long time. And I had been involved in activism as a high school student and then kind of became disillusioned and did a polar transformation in terms of my politics and was very imbued in the drank the Kool-Aid of Wall Street. And so I approached it with this sense of, this is really inefficient. There should be someone in charge. This is taking too long. Why, why is the General Assembly lasting forever? And became transformed by the process um, and almost unlearned my own indoctrination um, that I had sort of, I had felt I had been indoctrinated by the efficiency, the fetish of efficiency and the way that capitalism pushes us. to inefficiency, and the way that that manifested for me is the first General Assembly, and I should just explain, I think since most of you raised your hand, almost all of you know, but just in case you don't, the General Assembly was our decision-making body and a place where everyone could come together and have a voice. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Occupy was planned um, and organized by a lot of anarchists. And you know, being someone who worked on Wall Street, I used to think anarchist meant someone who wanted chaos and someone who wanted no rules, and that anarchy and chaos were just synonyms. And what I came to understand is that anarchism and anarchists typically are just trying to create a world where there is no oppression, and to tear down hierarchy, and to find a way that we can all be equals and have an equal voice. And so the General Assembly was 
you know, probably an imperfect attempt at that, but it, it was an attempt. And so the way that it worked is there was a facilitator who didn't have power. They weren't deciding what would be on the agenda. They were just trying to see what the group wanted to do. Um, you know, and people would, there wouldn't be the same facilitator every day. But as you might imagine, um, when you try to always come to consensus, which is what we always did, and try to figure out what the group wants to do, that's really slow. So I'm sitting there, you know, a year out of Wall Street, like, you know, I only lasted 15 minutes in the first one, and then I went to the second one, and I lasted about a half an hour, and then I went to the third one, and I lasted the whole time. And I came to see a value in being patient with each other. Because I, have, I come into any situation with a set of preconceived notions about what's right and what's wrong. And I think I'm the best. And I think I'm smarter than all of you. And if I give it time, and I wait, and I really hear you out, sometimes my mind will be changed. But I think we're sort of preconditioned to not allow that to happen. Right, we're, we're preconditioned to not allow ourselves to be challenged. And so that was one thing that, that I walked away with it is that there's this real beauty with inefficiency because it allows for movement and change and it allows me, um, it reminds me actually of something that was said in, in the Poetry Slam that, um, and I apologize that I forgot your name or I would say it. Lauren. Lauren, um, that you connected with people you felt like you had nothing you know, in common with. And that was sort of my experience there too is that that's the kind of thing that takes time. And if we're just obsessed with efficiency, we never get past it. Um, the other thing that, that I kind of got away from it, and I think this is true in all movements, is that community creates bravery because bravery is contagious. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, being a white woman, hadn't really experienced any form of police brutality. And I'm embarrassed to admit, wasn't really aware of the extent to which the police are often like terrorists in our own country um, until I went to that, to those protests. And that's because I was sheltered and because I, you know, I come from a position of privilege. And, you know, when you're all together and there are people from all different experiences, you start to have a shared experience and it tears down something that, um, I don't know if he invented the phrase, but Chris Hayes wrote about in his book, um, Twilight of the Elites, called Social Distance. And this idea that all of our leaders are in this bubble and they have this social distance so they can't empathize with anything and they won't do any work that doesn't affect them directly unless it's you know, FAA officials and they can't fly home to their districts and then you better believe they solve that problem right away because it affects them. Um, and so that was the other thing that, that came for me out of Occupy is there was a shared experience with people that I hadn't really come across before. And I think that that's true anytime we come together as movements, but even just come together in the commons. Um, and do people know what I mean if I say the commons? Some of you, I see nods. So just in case you don't, I guess what I mean by the commons is just everything is increasingly privatized in, in this country and I suppose around the world to some extent. And so the commons is just a place where we can all come together and not have to pay money in order to, to be together. Um, and so that was the other thing that, that I took away from it is that and I suppose that's why there was such a brutal overreaction by the police is because there is, in my opinion, so much power in all of us, big groups of us getting together because then we cross-pollinate. And I talk to you about an experience I might be blind to, and you talk to me about an experience that you might be blind to, and all of a sudden, you know, your struggle is my struggle, and then the powers that be have a problem. Um, and <laughs> I guess the other thing that, that was moving to me about it and this is something Michelle Alexander has talked about recently. She's the author of The New Jim Crow, which if you haven't read, you really should do that immediately. Um, <laughs> she did a Facebook post about getting out of her lane. And it was on the 50th, or is that right? The 50th anniversary of, of the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And she said that, you know, she's been so focused on mass incarceration, she hasn't been connecting the dots to drones. And she hasn't been connecting the dots to capitalism. And a lot of people criticized Occupy Wall Street because they said, you just want everything. You know, you want to fix the environment and you want to, you know, end police brutality and you want to do everything. And I feel like, you know, I'm very vindicated by when Michelle Alexander said, no, we need to do that. And, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was starting the poverty campaign at the time of his assassination. And so I think it's really important that movements connect the dot. And I think that increasingly around the world, that's what we see happening, right? Like we see maybe an event starts because there are transit hikes, but then all of a sudden you have a million people out in the street and, and we are airing more grievances than that. Um, but the other thing that I think is really powerful and the reason that I think 
civil society as a second superpower is is not just like a dream, right? It's a reality. Is when we come together in movements, like all of a sudden we have agency, and like the status quo wants us to think that our agency is you vote for a representative, and that representative will work on your behalf. Um, and I got into this little spat with Barney Frank recently. We were on this show together, and he was like, well, if people don't like the Tea Party, they should just vote for Democrats, and that's the answer to everything, and it's their fault if they're, you know, impoverished. And it's like, well, but, you know, we vote for Democrats, and then you, you're just pushing us to the cliff a little slower than the Republicans are. Um, but what I saw at Occupy was, like, innovation. Like, because we were all together, it was like, okay, we have this microeconomy, we have this place, what should we do with it? And all of a sudden, people were building bike generators, and then they were building gray water evaporation systems, and then they had a medical tent, and then there were people who had psychiatric training, um, thank you, and then there were people who, I don't know, were doctors that were giving free healthcare, and it's sort of like, all of a sudden, when you're all together trying to do good together, it's like, wow, what can I contribute? as opposed to feeling so beaten down, there's nothing I can do. Um, so just this sense of agency. And then I guess just a couple more things. One thing that um, I always debated, because one of the things that I did with Occupy was a super, super wonky thing. So I used to work on Wall Street, and I got involved with a group called Occupy the SEC for a while. Um, and Amy was kind enough to talk to me about it on her show, which was like, oh my god, that was amazing <laughs> to go on democracy now. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know? Um, but we, we wrote a really specific comment letter about this rule called the Volcker Rule, which is not like Glass-Steagall, but is the best thing that we had available. And so we just tried to make it better and point out all the loopholes. So that's very reformist. So people were like, well, but you're with Occupy, so aren't you about revolution, not reform? And I feel like, I feel like you can work on both at the same time. And, and specifically, the way I think that that's helpful is when you're all together in the commons and you're in a movement together and you trust the people the people include the people in power. You know, and they may be doing the wrong thing, but if you can bring them in and welcome them, they can be transformed. And until you can all dismantle the system together, perhaps they can work at a reformist angle from, from within. And, and that's not something I would have been naturally inclined to do, but we had a kitchen at Zuccotti Park and everyone was served, including if you were a guy in a suit with a fancy watch. And I really felt like there was, that was so important that we didn't turn anyone away and it wasn't like, you're a capitalist pig, go. You know, it was like, you are all welcome, we wanna know what you all think. Um, but that being said, um, there is something that Chris Hedges talks about a lot that I think is right, which is you have to choose what side you're on, which is you can either pursue power and prestige or truth and justice. And you can't have both of those as your master and so um, that's another thing that I kind of took away from Occupy. You know, we were scrappy, we had cardboard signs. It was sort of like, it was really unpretentious and I suppose that's part of the reason that it was, people didn't know what to say about us. Um, so just two more things, I guess. Um, and one is, I think one lesson from Occupy is when the mainstream media doesn't know and is so confused by what you're saying, they have no choice but to pass you the mic. Because they just don't know, like, you know what I mean? Like, journalists are so trained to summarize. And if it's so new and different that they're like, we have no idea, they just pass you the mic. Now, the, the downside of that is the people on the outside of the park who aren't always the people organizing it. And, you know, the media often would, you know, talk to the white men or whatever. And so there are some problems with that, but that was one lesson that I think can be used again. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say is Rebecca Solnit, who um, has written a lot of wonderful books, but one of them is called A Paradise Built in Hell, about the communities that emerge after disasters. And we always think that after disasters, we need the police to come in, and we need order and structure. And she talks about how people kind of naturally know what to do. And people would start directing traffic when there was an earthquake. And, and so I just think that the thing that I learned at Occupy that is so relevant no matter where you are is we just have to trust each other. Like we don't need these people on high controlling us. Like we do know what to do, but the problem is we're trained so much to look for the person in charge that like, you know, you, you go to a, a, an empty table and there are people milling about and they're like, 
Um, you know, I went to like a free store, a, like where you can literally go and take free clothing, and people are so confused by that. They're like, who's in charge? Is, what do I, how much does it cost? Like we're taught to look for authority. And once we can let go of that, I think, and trust each other, we all kind of realize that we do know what to do. Um, so uh, it was a little all over the place, but hopefully there was <laughs> some, something helpful in there. <laughs> Alexis Goldstein, she's communications director of The Other 98, and powerful, powerful issues, including trust each other as we build community, claim agency. Oh, thank you so much, Alexis, for, for carving out time to be here. We didn't miss it. We missed Samantha a little bit, but <laughs> we, we were really honored that yeah, you were great. here. Thank you for that contribution. Next, we move to Chiapas, to Mexico. We will have Manuel share with us some of the lessons of the Zapatista movement and what's to come for the 20th anniversary. Thank you, Emira. Buenos dias, amigos y amigas de IPS. I want to start also asking to raise your hands or not to raise them. How many of you have not heard about the Zapatistas in this room? Wow, thank you. Well, I want to say, first of all, it's such an honor to share this table with such important activists, and that's an understatement. And also that I'm very happy to be a member of IPS. I have worked with social movements in Mexico and Central America for many years. And I want to say that IPS for me, that I live in Washington, is the best trinchera, as we say in Spanish, the best trench possible to carry out my work and continue my work of solidarity with countries like Mexico and Central America that are suffering so much today. But it's time to celebrate. And just as we're going to deplore the 20 years of NAFTA on January 1st, we're going to celebrate on January 1st the 20 years of the rise of the Zapatistas who said, ya basta. <laughs> and also here, I want to remember our dear friend, Saul Lando, who made in 1996 that wonderful movie about the Zapatistas and other movies about, and other movies about social movements in Mexico, The Sixth Son, the Mayan Uprising in Chiapas, which is what actually brought me to IPS. That's when I started loving IPS, watching Saul Lando's movies. Far also, the Zapatistas from the mediatic limelight they were in for years, today the insurgents show the world humbly and proud through their escuelitas, or little schools as they're called, how they live in self-reliance and through projects of agroecology, transportation, cooperatives or arty crafts, fabrication of shoes, traditional medicines, tortillerias, and community shops, and so on. They are self-governed by five committees of buen gobierno, or good government, and an autonomous system of justice, in which the first way to apply it is through conciliation. As they said recently, and I quote, this is what we share with you, we didn't have anyone to tell us how to organize and how to construct our autonomies. Life started to show us how. But as we reflect on the 20 years of successful Zapatismo, we have seen during these two decades, at least, of course, the eruption of social movements everywhere. And to that neoliberal, corrupt, monopolizing political and economic system that the Zapatistas rose to, remember that it was at the same time of the coming into force of NAFTA. So movements all over the world are rising up today, and not only in the South, but in the North because the same policies of disenfranchising that we went through in Latin America in the 80s and the 90s are being applied today to every country in the North, including the US and European countries. This is what the Occupy Movement is about, responding to that challenge, and, and in particular since the 2008 crisis. But this is what we're living today in this country, in the United States. So just what, as the Zapatistas say before, bienvenidos a la pesadilla, welcome to the nightmare to the nightmare of neoliberalism. And the struggles go on everywhere. I just want to cite the Via Campesina, the Via Campesina that groups small farming all around the world and who today are calling for the right of people of, the, of all the world to land, to seeds, the right to produce and eat in a healthy way, exercising food sovereignty as opposed to food security. And they are convoking today to a global day of action 
that will be only in four days. That will be on October 16, a global day of action for food sovereignty of peoples all over the world. So let's be aware of that in four days. And as Via Campesina says, the food crisis is the most catastrophic crisis generated by the neoliberal economic system. But today there is also an emerging crisis to which I want to draw your attention. I just participated about two weeks to three weeks ago in a seminar in San Salvador, where anti-mining activists from all of Central America and Mexico came to remember their martyrs killed in the struggle against mining in the region. Although direct armed conflict has receded for almost two decades in Central America, some of their communities still live under threat of death and repression just because of opposition to destructive mining projects. Whole villages are besieged by the police, community leaders are threatened and killed, leaders of the anti-mining struggle indicted on charges of terrorism, and the destruction of natural resources and deteriorating health are part of the problems that are being experienced all over the region, the region that we call Mesoamerica. And also through phenomenal social movements, movements that we work with, like in El Salvador that has banned gold mining, as well as Costa Rica. Despite these successful efforts, these countries have been taken to the bench of the accused here in Washington by ruthless mining companies seeking to extort millions at the World Bank International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, right across the corner. And there, therefore, a larger struggle for social movements and that we work with now is to roll back these investors' rights granted under free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. Latin American countries are now agreeing to take collective action to oppose the increase of unfair lawsuits brought by transnational corporations against the governments of developing countries for alleged violations of trade agreements. Just to give you an idea, Costa Rica is being sued for a billion dollars because it closed up destructive coal mining. Uh, and El Salvador for more than 300 million. So, like the Zapatistas, and I please ask you to see this flyer that we have here, in which we have documents around all these cases and these issues. So like the Zapatistas that rose against NAFTA, all social movements struggling against the so-called free trade, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership today, are struggling for life and a world in which many worlds fit, like the Zapatistas said. Thank you. So powerful, not only the lessons of Chiapas, but what's come since then, those who are fighting against the status quo, against neoliberal economic systems that have oppressed so many, not only in Mesoamerica, but around the world. Well, closing us out, you all know her well. How many people, now I know all the hands will go up. Listen to Democracy Now! in the mornings here in DC, and, and on PBS, and on outlets all around the world. You know, she is our phenomenal Amy Goodman. Not only is she the voice of freedom and justice, she puts her life on the line. You know, we have seen her go on the plane with RSD not knowing where that plane would land, you know? <laughs> we have seen her in all her bravery covering what's going on in the Arctic, covering issues of, of domestic concern and people being pushed to the brink right in New York. Um, it's phenomenal the work that you do and we're honored that you're here. So we will have you, you know, just kind of share with us your reflections as you see these global movements, the other superpower now and into the future. Well, it is such a great honor to be here and to celebrate IPS 50 years. And of course, it's not so much about looking back, but how that builds a foundation for moving to the future. And this critical panel that's looking at this other superpower. I mean, I think we just saw it in the last weeks, in the last few months, the power of people talking about peace, not just saying no, and that had to do with Syria. I mean, I think it's important to understand this wasn't just about President Putin offering a plan. President Obama was against the wall in a way he did not expect because the American people overwhelmingly said no to war. It was astonishing what really took place, that he thought he could move forward easily as the people of this country are dealing with the, with the weight of the wars in Iraq and still in Afghanistan, that 
he could just move forward and unilaterally strike Syria. When he realized there were so many questions, he said you know, he would look for Britain as traditional war ally. Here was the prime minister of Britain um, saying, I have to take this to the parliament. And for the first time in 150 years, the members of parliament said no to a prime minister seeking those war powers. And here was President Obama waiting for him to get his answer yes in Britain, yet he wasn't planning to bring it to Congress until he saw he was completely alone in so much trouble and the people of his own party behind the scenes were saying, we can't do this if you ask us. And I am not saying if they held a vote that President Obama would have been defeated in his attempt to get authorization to strike Syria. He could have conceivably won. I mean, you saw the kind of arm twisting, for example, that went on around NAFTA. Um, it was possible, but the price he would have had to pay, and more importantly, all of these Congress members would have had to pay in their own districts. I was watching MSNBC the day they had Hakeem Jeffries on from Brooklyn. And they kept touting an interview they were about to have with Congress Member Jeffries saying, we're gonna bring you someone who is yet to be decided. And so Congressman Jeffries got on, and these congressmen were saying, I mean, 95% of their districts were saying no, and that was an underestimate. And he was saying this and saying it's very hard, and yet, you know, the president and his president of his party was um, pushing for war, and he had not yet made up his mind. Um, and the lower third of this interview with Hakeem Jeffries said, Hakeem Jeffries, colon, why I support the strike in Syria. And that was up for about 10 minutes. It never changed. It's hard for the media to get out of the mindset, war, yes, war, yes. Because so often the media are the cheerleaders for war. And that's why when we talk about all these different movements, it's also very important to talk about independent media and the media democracy movement, how critical it is that there be a forum for people to speak for themselves. How critical that is, and the decentralization of media that we've seen with the rise of the internet is absolutely critical. I agree with Phyllis, it's not about Facebook, it's not about Twitter, any one means of communicating. But breaking the hierarchical, as Alexis was talking about, not only the hierarchies of movements, but the hierarchy of the media, the gatekeepers, allowing us to communicate, which is why it is absolutely critical we continue to fight for net neutrality and not allow the corporations like the video companies and the telecoms write the legislation that will privatize the internet. We have to be able to, well, the corporations have been doing it for a long time, corporate globalizing, but at the grassroots, we must continue to be able to grassroots globalize, especially in a medium that was developed with public resources and is now so valuable they cannot be allowed to take it as their own. Um, I've just, we just flew up a few days ago from New Orleans um, where we did a story last Monday on Herman Wallace who lay dying in a prison hospital. He was dying of advanced liver cancer, but continued to profess his innocence. He was held consecutively more time in solitary confinement than any prisoner in the United States, close to 42 years. We condemn other countries for torture, we even talk about Guantanamo, and it's well known what went on there. But it starts at home. I mean, it is so important to make these connections. When we talk about Abu Ghraib in Iraq, who set it up? It was prison officials from New Mexico and from Arizona and from Connecticut who had been thrown out of their jobs for responsibility fatality in their prisons in this country. So they didn't have jobs here, so they went to Iraq on behalf of the United States and they set up Abu Ghraib. It's an amazing story. Um, and so we were there talking about the story, the case of Henry Wallace, who was in solitary confinement for all of these years because he was convicted of killing a prison guard, he and Albert Woodfox, two of the 
what's known as the Angola Three, and Angola is the plantation prison in Louisiana, named for the country in Africa where Africans had been brought to be enslaved in this country, and you have these images of 5,000 mainly African-American men being presided over as they pick cotton in this plantation prison by white guards on horseback carrying shotguns. That's the image of Angola. And here was Herman Wallace, his last place in the prison was not at Angola, but where he spent most of that time in the hole, in solitary confinement. Even the wife of the prison guard who was killed, the widow, Tini Verrett, said, I don't think these men did this. I mean, the fingerprint at the scene, it was not theirs. There was no evidence that connected them to the scene. What could have been the reason they were in the hole and they were convicted because of their organizing one of the first prison chapters of the Black Panther Party and they didn't want them communicating with other prisoners and so he spent decade after decade, we did the show on last Monday. On Tuesday, a Louisiana federal judge overturned the conviction of Herman Wallace. After 40, close to 42 years, yet how bittersweet how bittersweet. You know who delivered the news to him just by chance? The other two members of the Angola Three, Albert Wood Fox, who was brought to him in shackles that day, Tuesday, because he was going there to say goodbye because Herman was dying. And Robert King, who had been released a few years before the third of the Angola Three, his murder conviction overturned as well. He served 29 years in jail. Now, Robert, because he was outside the jail, Albert was inside, um, as he was coming into the prison to say his final farewell to Herman, who was dying, gets the news that the judge overturned his conviction, and he and Albert Wood Fox tell Herman, you will be free soon. And the judge demanded he be released immediately. This wasn't compassionate release. This was overturning a murder conviction. And the warden said he was going out to dinner. He would not be doing it all too soon. And the judge said, then you're gonna be held in contempt, perhaps imprisoned in his own prison. And so an ambulance pulled up to the prison. Herman Wallace was taken out of that prison. He died at a close friend's house the next day, but he was free at last. Now why tell that story when all we have is two minutes here? Because it is absolutely critical to see these connections as I think everyone in this room does between what happens at home and what happens abroad. I mean, as you heard, I mean, it's certainly something Dr. King knew, right? In 1967, when he gave that speech against the war in Vietnam at the Riverside Church, members of his inner circle were saying, don't do it, Martin. You have gotten the most powerful person on earth on your side, President Johnson. You got the Voting Rights Act passed. You got the Civil Rights Act passed. Why on earth would you alienate him now? And he said, no. He had to be consistent. And he stood up at the Riverside Church before thousands of people talking about justice at home and saying the country he loved, this country, was the most power, was the perhaps the most violent, was the country that was the most, uh, was the convey, the, con the purveyor. Oh my God, I've said this so many times. It's, the greatest purveyor of violence on earth. This reminds me of my brother, Steve, who used to be at Johns Hopkins. He moved to the West Coast, but he's also an opera singer. And he was invited to sing when the Orioles played the Star Spangled Banner. I don't know if he was in the operating room. No, he doesn't operate, but he, they called him at the last second. He raced there, he got up, and he couldn't remember the word. <laughs> the great, um, I don't know about comparing the Star Spangled Banner to Dr. King's speech, but the greatest purveyor of violence on earth today. And it's absolutely critical, and I think it's what IPS does so well, making those connections and having a media that is there to bring out the voices of people, like Alexa said, at Occupy Wall Street, what the media considered the great weakness of Occupy was all of the different signs. Like, what do these people want? Well, it's because they saw all these issues connected. And let's not forget, as people marched September 17, 2011, on Zuccotti Park in New York, that among those signs were many held that said, I am Troy Davis. 
linking what happens here in this country to the rest of the world, who four days later, on September 21st, 2011, and Democracy Now! was, on there, at, was there on the grounds of the Jackson, uh, Georgia prison, the death row prison of Georgia, when he was finally executed, having spent more than half his life on death row for a crime to his dying breath, he says, he did not commit. And his final words were looking up his executioners as he was strapped down on that gurney as they were about to inject him with the chemicals. God have mercy on your souls. God bless your souls. It is critical we look at the death penalty in this country today, at the number of people on death row and in the prisons of this country, and understand the connection between that and poverty in the United States, who lives and who dies, and the connection between those inequalities and what the United States is doing in the rest of the world. And in all of these cases, how critical it is to have a media open enough, turning on those mics to allow people who are at the target end of either domestic policy in this country or foreign policy in other countries to have their say, to frame the picture, to be able to be heard. Because I do think, as we come back to this title, protesting globally, civil society is the su second superpower, that those who are concerned about war, who are concerned about the environment, who are concerned about the growing disparity in this country, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take the media back. Thanks so much. Well, we thank you for taking the media back on a daily basis. We thank you for bringing out stories like Herman Wallace, for giving him the space. I listened and cried. I don't know about any of you, but it just, it just touched my heart, the way you told, allowed his story to be told, and then hearing the news the following day that, that, uh, that he had transitioned. So we are just honored that Democracy Now!, that WPFW!, that our media, community-based media, exists, and that you create a space, a voice for the voiceless. We just applaud you. Um, we by the way, anyone who wants to hand out many of these in your own communities and at your workplaces, it's all the places Democracy Now! broadcasts just here, like WHUT, Howard's PBS station. We just went on Maryland Public Television, of course, on WPFW every morning live at 8 o'clock. But we got to support and build the media that brings out the voices of all of you and people like you around the world. So we have a bit of time for questions, for comments, um, for praise, you know, um, as we, again, focus on the second superpower, social movements here in the U.S. and around the world. Looking in the past 50 years, here we go. And visioning forward for the next 50 years. We have a mic going around. Oh. Please, and please just introduce yourself as you ask your question or stay your comment. Thank you very much. My name is Ni Akwete. Um, I'm a friend of IPS. Um, I, I thank you very much for this whole weekend and I especially thank you for this panel. For a tired activist like me, this is uh, oxygen. <laughs> so, so thank you. Now, for my question, I hope it's not a downer, but I mean, what gives me the oxygen is movements and their power. But in the little organizing I do, you also have NGOs, both here and in Africa. And the big difficulty is money. And especially in Africa, I did a bit of work for George Soros, handing out money to good NGOs in Africa. 
And it always worried me that how do we build strong movements and NGOs in Africa if all the money is coming from outside, even from progressive forces outside. So can you share how we find good money to strengthen NGOs so that we can have powerful movements? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that question, Ni. Nee. Maybe we come over here. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Hughes Freytek with Peace Brigades International. Um, we help protect human rights activists on the grounds and area of conflict, and it was such an interesting panel. And I also get so motivated from hearing and working together as a movement because it gets exhausting sometimes out there. Um, I wanted to first say, I also wanted to recognize um, the first Palestinian intifada. Um, I went in 1988, and that was one of the most amazing nonviolent resistance movements that we didn't hear a lot about, but it actually got me very engaged. My name's Roger Lesser. I worked at the Institute for 10 years from 1969 to 79, and I'm now retired, and this is more a comment. I think we're at, what's the right word? We're at a world-changing moment in a way. And some of it is good, like Amy talks about, it, Alexis and Amy and Phyllis and other, it is so, we're so far behind in a way, you know, what's happened in the last two weeks in the Congress. I mean, we have to push aside the Republicans and probably we have to push aside the Democrats too yeah. because neither of them really speak to the needs of humanity. And we're in a moment that we all have to raise our efforts to speak, you know, as people have talked about, about the prison issue, about the drug issue, about the school issue, about the fact that we still have ghettos in a country that's still wealthy, that we have a worse income distribution since 1929, that we have an unmobilized country in spite of all this, and in spite of what Phyllis is saying about people in the world, the reaction to this in the United States of what's going on here is kind of pathetic of what's happening in our own country, you know, and we have to up our temperature because otherwise the people in power will push us off the face of the earth along with the other people. And I don't know really how we do that right now, but we need to create some kind of institutions, whether you call it a party, whether you call it a structure, which encompasses on some level or other all these fights against these things that are cruel to human beings and that don't bring out the best of what's for people. And the moment needs to be now. We don't have any more time to wait to do that. Thank you so much, Roger. So maybe we'll take the last person in the, in the back and then we'll come back another round. Thank you. Shelley Fudge with Jewish Voice for Peace. And I'd like to ask a question about the Arab Spring and what happens from here. Uh, you know, the U.S. government is still not willing to say anything about it being a coup. And I haven't heard a groundswell yet emerging to deal with that. But beyond that alone, what is it that we can be doing here as American activists to help support those who are now being oppressed even more than ever? The backlash there is unbelievable, as in, and in many other countries, of course, in the Middle East. So I'd like to hear your comments. Thanks. Thank you so much. Maybe we can begin with Alexis and work our way down. Anyone who wants to comment on any of the questions? Anyone who wants to comment? Maybe Please. Or is there anyone who wants to comment? Yeah, there's no order. We don't have to go into the I just have a really quick comment about the TPP, which is um, uh, I think that it's really important to remember that headline risk is one of the only risks left. I have some friends who are staffers, congressional staffers, and at least as it relates to the big banks, the only thing that they feel weak on is headline risk, which is why what Amy talked about is so important. But when this is not related to the TPP, but they hate it, for example, when members of Congress will say a bank name on the floor. So the more we can encourage them to do that. Um, but I just, I feel like I hear about the TPP and I just want to go in a hole and hide. But um, I've started to notice on my Twitter feed that there's some group, I think it might be the Business Roundtable, 
doing sponsored tweets telling me how awesome the TPP is. So that actually gives me hope that maybe they actually do feel vulnerable because I felt, you know, you hear all these stories about how it's all closed door and secret and we have no influence, but I feel like if that were 100% true, why would they bother advertising to me on Twitter? Um, so that's one little small hope that they must feel vulnerable because otherwise they wouldn't spend any money. I cannot, no, I think you. <laughs> Well, <laughs> the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a uh, NAFTA on steroids, as it's <laughs> been called. And it's a f so called free trade agreement between 12 countries in Latin America, the United States, Canada, and Asia and the Pacific. Uh, don't ask me to name all of them now, but <laughs> you can look at it. Uh, these 12 countries are negotiating this NAFTA like agreement, which they call it like a free trade, but it's not free trade, it's not about uh, just reducing uh, tariffs to pens and paper and actual things, but it's more than anything about granting investors with enhanced rights and rights like those that we describe here, rights that allow them to sue governments uh, when governments implement responsible uh, for environmental or social policies. And this sounds lunatic like, like a conspiracy, but it's not. There are hundreds of cases now, uh, not only in the international, uh, in the ICSID at the World Bank, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes going on now for, for hundreds of millions of dollars, mostly against third world countries, against the global south, by corporations from the north. So this is, co this is happening, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership will all, all only increase that, as well as another major thing, which is uh, prevent countries from gaining access to chief medicines, like generics. And I could go on and on and on explaining what the TPP is, but let me make a commercial. On Thursday, <laughs> sorry, on Friday, we have a meeting at IPS, which is open to everyone, organized with Public Citizen, with Sierra Club, about the TPP. So, so instead of carrying on now, why don't you come on Friday to IPS at 12 or 12.30, I'm not sure, but you can look at the web page from Tuesday, we will post information about this event. And we have uh, Melinda San Luis from Public Citizen, uh, Ilana from Sierra Club, and people from Mexico, actually, people from the Mexican National Network of Free Trade, and people from Canada, because in the three countries, what we're working on now is to demonstrate all the negative impacts of NAFTA. And this is not, not a useless exercise. This, we're doing this to demonstrate that the TPP will deepen the, the crisis that uh, workers and farmers and people all over the world are suffering under these, t these type of agreements. You know, I wanted to actually respond to two of the questions that were kind of linked. One was about, you know, we're at this moment when it seems like nothing is happening, when there's this huge crisis arising. And the other was Shelley's specific question about the Arab Spring, because I think they're linked in a certain way. You know, you could simplify and say, well, it's a glass half empty, glass half full, and that's, you know, there's a value to that, but not very often. What there is a value to, I think, is looking at the process of what success looks like. Because I think we don't think about that very often. We don't think about uh, what, what are we actually trying to make happen here. It's easier when we're against something. We stop the possibility for that moment of a war in Syria. We're working now to stop the, TTP, the TPP. Those are easy things to see when we have a victory. It's a victory for one small, ultimately, however important, it's one small aspect of this systemic challenge that we face. But there's something broader going on, and this has to do with what Alexis was talking about, about how, what people learned from the Occupy movement. You know, the fact that the combination of police repression and a bunch of other reasons that the Occupy structures are not functioning right now should not convince us that Occupy left nothing behind. The whole fact that the discourse in this country is not about the debt, but it's about inequality, can be linked to the work of Occupy. And I would say that right now in the Middle East, although we have seen virtually no shift in policy except that imposed on the administration and Congress by the facts on the ground that our colleagues and comrades are creating, we have seen and we are seeing on a daily basis an incredible shift in the discourse in this country. And while we know that our democracy is so flawed that 
public opinion doesn't itself make policy or stop policy, it is true that members of Congress can be scared and the president can be scared when they think the political price is too high. If we look again at the Syria example, what do we see there? We see where APAC, among others, the major component of the pro-Israel lobbies, they were late to the game for a host of reasons I won't get into in terms of their collaboration with the Syrian regime going back many years, as was the US collaboration with the Syrian regime. I'm not gonna talk about that. The point is, they didn't jump on board the let's get Assad train until very recently. But when they did, they got on it on steroids, as Manuel said. They got on it hard and fast and tough. And APAC was right there with them, as always, pushing, let's go after APAC. We need regime change. This is all about Iran. We have to send a message to Iran. And you know what? APAC lost. That itself was huge. Now, APAC has lost before. They don't win every time but they have never lost as the result of public mobilization. They've lost when it was a fight between Is Israel in, uh, the Israeli interests and APAC on the one hand, and the arms manufacturers and the money interests and the war interests on the other hand, when those guys wanted to send weapons to Saudi Arabia and Israel said, no, we don't think so, guess who won that fight? So yeah, APAC can lose, but this was the first time it had ever lost because we beat it down. Not some arms manufacturers. The no war people beat APAC. Now that's huge. The fact that we are able to change the discourse on the Middle East so that right now when we hear, oh, there's new peace talks underway between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And the answer across most of this country is, ah, yeah, and what's for dinner? There is no interest because people don't buy it anymore. Nobody's looking to cheer like we cheered some people. I shouldn't say we because I didn't, but many people cheered for the Oslo agreements 20 years ago. There was hope because we thought it was going to mean something that it didn't turn out to mean. This time around, nobody's buying it. And as long as enough of us aren't buying it, they can't buy us. That's the big question about discourse. And finally, on the question, I'm not going to go into all the, the detail I would with Shelley on the question of the Arab Spring in Egypt, it's in a terrible moment, but this is a question of the long term. The situation in Egypt is devastating right now. There was a military coup. The US has pulled back on its military aid. They haven't stopped all the aid to the government, but they've pulled back all the major uh, um, weapon systems they were about to sell, with the exception of those that have something to do with the Sinai, which has everything to do with Israel. So yeah, we haven't beaten APAC entirely, but, but, the fact that this is still a moment when the people of Egypt have reclaimed their rights as citizens and are saying, we were willing to stand up and overthrow a dictatorship that treated us as subjects and claim instead our rights as citizens to claim our country, claim our own collective agency. And then a lot of people got misled and stood up in support of the coup. We can't pretend that's not the case. A lot of people supported the coup and are supporting it now. But I am convinced, and here's where I'm being optimistic, which as many of you know, I'm never optimistic. <laughs> but I'm being very optimistic that in Egypt, people are going to remember, are going to remember what it meant to stand up and say, no, not Mubarak, not his people, and not the United States of America are going to run our country. We have the right to run our country. And they're gonna remember that and they're gonna do it again. That's what's changed. People have seen the possibility. They've seen it in their own country. They've seen it in Tunisia. They're seeing it in a horrific, problematic way in, in Libya, even in Syria, as devastating as the war is in Syria. It's rooted in a sense of empowerment that people are demanding. And that's what these movements are all about. That's what the second superpower has left us with as a legacy. So we are so already out of time. <laughs> I thought we could go one more round of questions and we really, I'm sorry, we, our, our goal is to try to end these right on time. Um, it, it, yeah? Two, three, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, I want to, before we, we're gonna close this out. We're gonna close this out just as we began with our phenomenal poets. This time it is Allende, AKA Renegade. Wow. 
<laughs> who's going to lend us his vision. The microphone there. Can I just say that Amy and I are both speaking in the plenary in, in an hour? <laughs> How y'all doing? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Allende, a.k.a. Renegade. Um, before I do my piece, I just want to say that we as the people hold the power to make any change. And by power, I just mean ability. I mean influence. So we hold that influence. And the strength of that influence that we have is, comes in numbers. And I feel like it's up to us to locate which, what issue we want to tackle or locate what, is really resonate, what really resonates with us and um, do what we can to build on that, see organizations, the basically organizations by the people, for the people, need to be led by the people so that they can be for the people. So that's just, I'm just saying that, keep that in mind to build on what, um, what the panel was talking about, what we're here for today, just brotherhood, sisterhood, all that. But um, yeah, I'll do a poem as well. I mean, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. The digital age sees slave as synonymous with convict. But in the nonfiction that we live in, and I got a conflict. You see, times are different than when my grandmother was a little kid. Segregation's not legal anymore, but the suppression, it still exists. The suppression is stop and frisk. The suppression is gentrification. Babies having babies. The suppression is perpetuated through a lack of education, fashion statements, and most of all, the taste for monetary creations. The suppression causes me to question, where is tranquility's location in this capitalist equation? Where can I find my elation in this Western civilization? Is it the temptations of lust, greed, and vanity? Must I surrender to BET to solidify my identity? As a young black man in this psychotic society, I pray to Marcus Garvey and to my ancestry who I've been taught to reject. But I've been blessed by the words of Malcolm X to project the revolution from the birds to the projects. You see, I'm on a quest to become a black nationalist, but I'm stuck in modern day Rome. Babylon, I just want to go home. I need a permanent vacation. And I just finished meditating. Now I'm headed for the pad and paper. It's time to let the people know the truth. I hope that they can face it. I use the scriptures for the formulation of these mental pictures. Vivid descriptions of my peers rising against the system. And so they may ask me, where does that brother find his elation in this Western civilization? My happiness is not the property, but I pursue the liberation. This liberation starts with self-knowledge. It's unified and honest. This liberation is cooperative in its economics. But spiritual elevation is distasteful to the masses of my generation. So this liberation, it seems to be an abstract topic. But I won't stop until Kwame Torre gets his props. I won't stop until we eradicate every single crooked cop. I won't stop. I won't stop. I just won't stop. I'ma keep using the rhyme and the beatbox to kickstart the revolution and make Uncle Sam knees knock. Peace and power to the people. AKA Renegade.